So hi, I'm Palmer. I'm here to talk about RISC-V. Um, I'm working on RISC-V for a while. I maintain a bunch of software stuff. I run the software team at Sci-5, and I'm the vice chair of the RISC-V software uh, working group at the RISC-V Foundation, kind of involved in everything. So this is an introduction to RISC-V. So you know, why is this important? Why, why does an instruction set, uh, an ISA, instruction ar architecture, matter? Right, so if you look kind of around the computing industry, right, you look and you see, well, Intel can't sell into the mobile uh, the mobile market, largely because you know, that's dominated by ARM ISA chips. Right? Similar, you know, ARM has trouble selling into the server market, right? again, largely because that's dominated by Intel ISA chips. Right? And still, you look at your first kind of ISA that was largely successful, the IBM 360, it's been going for 50 or so years, and they really dominate the mainframe market. And it's all about software compatibility. So the ISA is the most important interface in a computing system. It's the interface between the software and the hardware. Right? So it's what all your instructions do, that sort of stuff. Changing the ISA is a lot of work. It requires redoing the whole software stack, as I'm sure many of you have tried to do before. Um, so uh, we look around the kind of computing world, and you find that open software, open standards work pretty well. Right? They, they work great in networking. You know, internet took over the world, the internet uh, protocols and whatnot. Right? In the OS land, we have a POSIX, which is not the greatest of standards, but there are multiple implementations of POSIX-like things, and you can be reasonably compatible between them. Right, C has worked pretty well. There are C compilers where you can take the same C code and meet a spec and actually get the right answer out, both free and proprietary implementations. Uh, databases stuff, SQL worked really well for databases. Graphics with OpenGL, there are OpenGL implementations where they're compatible between multiple vendors. But then if you look at an ISA, there's really been no successful free and open standard ISA. Uh, there have been some attempts. Spark proposed a uh, version of their ISA as an open standard, uh, but it didn't work out because it was kind of crusty by the time it actually made it to become an open standard. Right, so you wonder around looking, and you think, gee, you know, there are no free and open standard ISAs, right? Why? Um, and it's not really because the existing ISAs are really good designs. They've all just kind of come about and become popular in a particular market because they're necessary to get a job done. We'll go a little bit more into that later. So this is really what RISC-V was designed to do. It is a high quality license and royalty free ISA specification. We designed it at UC Berkeley. Uh, originally, we designed it for our own uses in academic research, and it got popular. People started asking questions about it, so we spun off a nonprofit foundation to maintain the ISA. Uh, the ISA is designed to be suitable for all types of computing systems, so kind of small microcontrollers all the way up to large supercomputers. Right? There are lots of cores for it. There are proprietary cores, and there are open source cores. We at Sci-Fi have maintained some open source cores, and we also sell some proprietary cores. Uh, it's had really rapid uptake in the last uh, couple of years, maybe two or three years, since we really started treating this as a public thing. Um, it's grown rapidly. We have hundreds of members in the RISC-V Foundation, implementations all over the place, a large software stack, all that sort of stuff. Um, and like anything else, it's kind of a work in progress, so it's always growing. Um, if you're new to RISC-V, these are my kind of couple slides. People today know a little bit more about it than uh, when I started giving these, but we do have something called the RISC-V Reader, and this is sort of a cookbook introduction to RISC-V if you're used to programming other, say, like bare metal microcontrollers uh, that smell like RISC machines, RISC-V isn't really that different. Uh, this book's designed to get you spun up really fast. Andrew and Dave wrote it. They sell it on the Amazon print-on-demand thing, so nobody really makes any money off it. Um, and I've heard it's a good book. I haven't actually read it. No. Not the gre greatest salesman. <laughs> so so we'll, talk, we'll talk about uh, the, the origins of the RISC-V ISA, right, a little bit of kind of a history thing. So I started it. Berkeley uh, in 2010, uh, Berkeley's Computer Arch Architecture Research Group had done lots of designs on lots of old ISAs. Right? They kind of invented the whole risk thing. Right? They had done MIPS, Spark designs, some x86 designs, uh, and we're looking around and saying, okay, well, what are we going to do for our next research project at Berkeley? Right? We're going to go do a microarchitecture. We're going to do some interesting computer architecture research. So the obvious choices at the time are x86 and ARM. Right? So uh, we'll go kind of shoot those down. Right, so if you look at x86, the first instruction in the Intel manual is AAA, which is ASCII adjust after addition, right? which makes a lot of sense because uh, it's for BCD and calculators, right? and that's what the ISA was designed for. Uh, it just kind of works well enough. So it takes an implicit source and destination register, right, which is kind of common in x86 land. It does a bunch of weird, complicated stuff to it. They actually screwed this up in the 286, uh, so it wasn't compatible between the previous implementations, but they just kind of ran with it anyway, so it makes a little less sense than it's supposed to. And this is a single byte instruction, you know, so you've lost one 256th of your ISA encoding space on uh, BCD conversion, which is not a particularly efficient use. Um, okay, right, but that's Intel. Everybody knows Intel's ISA is quite complicated. It's been around for a while, it's been backward compatible for a million years, all that kind of stuff. So we'll look at ARM, right, which is a RISC ISA, so it should be 
simple, right? right? ARM, Acorn, Risk Machine, right? It's got risk in the name. So there's an instruction in there called LDMIAEQ, right? Which is <laughs> too, too long uh, to actually be a risk machine. Uh, so you look at what it does, right? So it, it's load multiple and increment the address, right? So it's basically loading and saving multiple registers to the stack, right? Or to, to the offset of any register, right? It can write up to seven registers and load from six memory locations uh, in a single instruction. It's conditional, right? Uh, so it only executes if a condition code is set. Um, it writes to the PC, so it's a conditional branch because the PC is an addressable register in the ARM instruction set. Uh, so you can write to it on pretty much any instruction, right? And then additionally, it can change instruction sets because the thumb instruction set is delineated by the low bit of the PC, right? So this single instruction, which is used commonly, it's the idiom for pop the stack and return a function call. It's a nice compact way to, ex to encode that, and therefore it has to be quite fast. Uh, it can also do all sorts of wacky stuff, um, which is kind of a, a nightmare for verifying your implementations and uh, writing software for it and all that sort of stuff. So ARM was kind of not an option. Uh, for an academic project, at least, it's just way too complicated to implement. Uh, yeah, so x86, too complicated. ARM, also too complicated. At the time, there was no 64-bit uh, that was widely available. Um, and then both of the x86 and ARM had IP issues, right? You'll get sued if you try to sell something without getting a license for them, which is a bummer. Not a big deal for academic stuff, but uh, no fun in the real world. Um, so uh, in summer of 2010, we started a three-month project. This was before, slightly before I got there. Uh, the principal designers, Andrew, Dave, uh, Jensen, and Kirsta, started the ISA, thought, OK, we'll take the summer off, and we'll do an ISA so we can go use this for our microprocessor research. Um, and so it took four years, uh, and we actually got the first ISA spec released. Um, uh, so that's when we decided to, to, to freeze the ISA spec version 2.0, which is the one that's going to be compatible forever. And this is one of the important parts of the RISC-V ISA, is that once a spec is released, it's a proper standard from the foundation, and it never changes. It's compatible forever. We can't change it. Um, and this, we think, is important because software compatibility will last forever. Right? So we think the RISC-V ISA is a good ISA, but everybody thinks their ISA is a good ISA. So we have a couple of metrics that we like to use. So the one is static code size. So static code size is really important for the embedded market because if you want to fit your code in Flash, then that's basically the price of your processor. Right? So if you look across both 32-bit and 64-bit architectures, RISC-V with our compressed instruction set, which is a thumb-style thing, uh, beats everybody, at least on, on some benchmarks. Um, and then in the other metric we like to use is called dynamics byte, bytes fetched. And this is what we think is important for higher end implementations. Uh, because there, you know, you're going to end up limited by instruction fetch, front end stuff. Uh, the complexity of instructions doesn't matter as much because your implementation is large. What really matters is how many bytes you're fetching. And this is on spec uh, total dynamics bytes fetched across the board. Uh, risk five with a compressed instruction set uh, also works out pretty well. Um, it works, you know, it's, it, people think x86 is a quite dense instruction encoding, but the 64-bit ISA is really not that dense of an instruction encoding, um, and it's not super duper hard to beat. Um, so while we were doing this, uh, part of the reason the ISA took so long is because we were building a bunch of chips at the time. So this is out of date because I haven't updated my slides in a year. Um, but these are the implementations, the silicon implementations from our Berkeley research group that were done in parallel with the RISC-V ISA development. So you can see the first one was 2011, and that had an old version of the ISA. Right, which is incompatible and broken and the chip didn't work and all that sort of stuff. And after a dozen rounds, we ended up building something fairly solid. An ISA we think works well, got a lot of papers out of it, had a lot of working chips. Um, and that's kind of a big part of the reason why we think the ISA is well designed is because we weren't under a lot of pressure to ship a product that had to work. Right? We could you know, go mess around in academic research for four years, iterate on things, uh, and throw away the ideas that were bad. And there, there were bad ideas in the early versions. Uh, so we taped out a lot of chips, spent a lot of time doing it. It's really hard to tape out chips in small volumes. Um, so we had uh, lots of chip problems, lots of board problems. So what ended up happening is uh, we put like an organic package on one of the first chips, uh, and it couldn't stand the temperature of the commercial reflow ovens. So we had to go build our own reflow oven to avoid, avoid burn, burning up the package, which we did. Remus's apartment <laughs> out of an old toaster oven and a little Raspberry Pi, and you you know twiddle the thing to get the temperature right. Um, we, got, we got we got working chips right. Here's one consuming some power right, which is what chips are supposed to do. Um, but it actually does execute instructions as well. It's just harder to show on the screen. Um, and they do work. Yeah, it's a, it's a long journey. It was fun, um, but now we've kind of spun this off into a commercial entity. And this is sort of where I get involved. I this is. Picture of my desk at Berkeley. I was sitting here, and the guys on the other side of the wall uh, were working on RISC-V, and they're all microarchitects. 
Right? Uh, I was working on some other project. I was kind of my architecture guy at the time. Right? And I kept hearing complaints over the wall. Hey, you know, the RISC-V GCC port doesn't work. Right? Or, you know, it can't boot Linux or this sort of stuff. So I thought, gee, that sounds more interesting than what I'm working on. So I'll just go kind of help out. <laughs> 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 yep, uh, so you know, it got, got involved by just seeing some fun stuff going on. Um, and it turns out there's a lot of software I kind of didn't know I was, what I was getting myself into, I suppose. Uh, this is the first patch we sent out. And I thought this was a really big deal at the time, right? This was four years ago. We sent the first patch out, sent it out to the mailing list. And this was to add the RISC-V tuples to config.sub, right? Which is a fairly small patch, but that was, whoa, man, we're getting real. Um, and it's come a long way uh, in the last, I guess, four years, kind of. It's uh, eight years since they really started the whole project. Right, so we can talk a little bit now about what we have currently. Um, so we have a RISC-V Foundation, which is a industry trade group. It's you know, a nonprofit foundation. Companies can join. You pay some money and that sort of thing. Um, and individuals can join as well if you're kind of an open source hacker guy. Uh, it runs working groups. Working groups produce standards, and the standards become ratified as proper RISC-V standards, kind of the, the normal way to run a, uh, a specification foundation. And we've got. 100 plus members, the slide's old. Uh, a lot of big companies and it. It's become a big deal. Um, and the main goal of the RISC-V uh, organization is to produce RISC-V ISA specifications. So the big one is the user mode ISA specification. That's where most of the code runs, right? That's the, you know, adds and multiplies and that sort of stuff. RISC-V specification itself is described as a set of base specifications and a set of optional extensions. This is part of the reason we can provide this permanent cat compatibility guarantee because you can turn things on and off quite confident that the base ISA is good enough to last for a long time. Right? The extensions that we've uh, standardized so far right, are things that are pretty straightforward. And then more advanced ones like vectors and symbian, that sort of stuff are coming in the future. We also have a privileged ISA specification, which is what you write supervisors and bootloaders and that sort of stuff to. Uh, that is currently a draft, but we've committed to stability even if the foundation hasn't ratified it. That specs out a supervisor mode, hypervisor mode, and then machine mode stuff, which is where platform firmware runs. Then initially, we have some things like uh, external debug specifications, so you can talk to the thing over JTAG uh, when you first bring it up, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's one I'd like to point out, because I think it's really cool, is the RISC-V memory model, which is the first uh, specification officially ratified by the foundation. Uh, I don't know if it's 100% done yet, but it's the first one that was submitted for ratification. Um, and it's actually, uh, it's really nice. It's a fairly clean memory model. I think, I'm not really a memory model guy, but I could read the PDF and write the Linux source code, so it can't be that bad. Um, and it's cool, it's actually described in a way that's somewhat orthogonal from the actual RISC-V instruction set. Uh, so the memory model can apply to lots of different things. And we had this in before we had, uh, certainly before we had distros and before we had a real solid uh, Linux port. Um, so it's been really nice to be able to answer questions on the Linux kernel memory model mailing lists with uh, an actual spec, um, which helps a lot. Uh, so yeah, we started doing a bunch of software based on these specifications, right? The ISA specifications are what tie the software to the hardware. Uh, so. Uh, we write software for the specifications. Uh, Linux kernel port's the big one, that's why we're all here. Uh, it's been upstream for about a year now. Um, it boots, it boots on QMU, and it kind of sort of boots on some hardware if you're really, really careful with it. Um, we ran at the last, not the last ELC, the one in Portland, uh, maybe nine months ago or something, we ran a hackathon. It's another one of those things where, like sending out that first patch set, it's like, wow, I never thought we'd get this big, seeing Sci-Fi's name next to Intel sponsoring a Linux Foundation conference. Ooh, that's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, and we had some guys come uh, to hack on the boards. It was the first time the boards were out in public. Um, we had a, a Yocto port that got spun up on it. Um, and then we had a, a JavaScript implementation that got spun up as well. Um, we have a tool chain. This is kind of the core of the ISA stuff, right? Uh, is, you have a GNU-based tool chain. Um, it's in pretty good shape. It's been upstream for more than a year now. And we're at the point where, you know, if you have some C code and you compile it and it doesn't do what you want to do, it's probably not because there's a bug in the compiler. It's probably something else, which is great. Um, it took a long time to get there. Uh, compilers are a lot of work. Um, additionally, we have open source hardware. So at Sci-5, uh, uh, well, I guess at, at Berkeley, we started producing all open source uh, everything, the hardware, the software, the specs. Um, and that was done because that's kind of how Berkeley mandates everything's done. And at Sci-5, we grew that into a company that we really like open source. And we release uh, the core of our hardware implementations as open source. Um, so here we have an FPGA that we gave to the Fedora guys that you can boot the RISC-V Fedora port on, and that will run open source RTL, right? 
through the proprietary Xilinx CAD tools, unfortunately. But open source RTL running on, uh, you know, Sci-Fi's open source RTL running on an FPGA that will then boot, you know, the whole open source software stack. Right, so I think uh, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, we also have some ASIC implementations here. And you can get the Fedora port. It's online. There's a website, all that sort of stuff. That works pretty solidly. Um, I think this is the, the demonstration that open standards can work uh, in uh, the ISA space. Right, so you see here, you know, we have this large breadth of software. I didn't write it all. In fact, I didn't really write much of it. Um, but uh, we've gotten a lot of buy-in from various other RISC-V vendors. Right, some software vendors, some hardware vendors, a lot of guys at Sci-Fi, and then some of the traditional open ecosystem people you'd expect, like Red Hat. So we have my co-maintainers of the various core projects floating around the RISC-V ecosystem. The slide's old, we've gotten a little bigger. Um, so uh, in addition to this, we have uh, a lot of interest in the embedded space. One of the things people like about RISC-V in embedded land is that the ISAs smell very similar between the Linux style stuff and the embedded style stuff. You get the similar protection mechanisms that are you know, optional supervisor mode, that sort of stuff. So we have Zephyr, which is another Linux Foundation project that we're really excited about. Uh, I hadn't heard of it before. Ant Micro, who's one of the early RISC-V software vendors, got involved. They did a port. Uh, the RTOS seems really clean. There's a good community around it. And we've got, we're investing a lot in that in uh, the Sci-Fi side of things and on the RISC-V side of things. So we've got the Zephyr SDK up and running on the boards. There's a couple of embedded boards you can get. Uh, you know, the whole thing's kind of ready to go. And there's a uh, proper release that has decent RISC-V support. And it's been device triified, so you can mess around with things on the board. And that came out maybe a month or two ago. Um, so that's a great place to play if you like uh, the embedded RTOS space. Uh, additionally, we have some Linux distros. So we have Fedora, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can go uh, on the internet and get the disk images and a tutorial of how to boot it on either boards or QMU, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's self-hosting, so it builds its own package images all the time. The build farms are actually running on some hardware that we gave to the Fedora guys, and they say it's reasonably stable. So all, all pretty solid stuff. We have a Debian port. This I'm super excited about. It's very hard to read, but we actually have more packages in the RISC-V Debian port than Itanium has, uh, <laughs> 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 which is awesome, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's one of those things, you know, I came came to Berkeley and I didn't know about the RISC-V thing. And they said, oh, we're going to do our own ISA. And I said, you know, it's a really dumb idea. There's a lot of software and there's no way you're going to get someone like Red Hat to go spin, your, spin a port up for, for some ISA you did. But uh, yeah, I guess it worked. So <laughs> no complaints. Uh, but it's really great. Yeah, and this is our kind of kernel verification methodology. You go boot the Debian port. You get a bunch of packages. And it is a real computer. Oh, yeah, more distros. We have op uh, open embedded Yocto Kemraj, who does a lot of open embedded stuff. Uh, got real, involved really early in RISC-V, and the Yocto support has been really solid uh, for a while. Lots of community around it, patches go by, all that sort of thing. And you can run a bunch of stuff. You can run X, it runs on the board, all, all those sort of things. There's some out of tree patches necessary for the kernel and whatnot that they integrate, um, but it works pretty solidly. Uh, so in terms of hardware implementations, that was all kind of software stuff. Hardware implementations, Sci-5 uh, sells a hardware implementation of RISC-V. Uh, so we'll sell people RTL, who, that they go integrate into their implementations, and we also sell ASICs and then dev boards based on it. Uh, so here's the Hi5 Unleashed, which has been out since February, and you can go buy it on the internet. Um, it's a quad-core RISC-V. We did it on TSMC's 28 nanometer, and it kind of looks like one of the uh, A53 dev boards. You get similar spec stores, that sort of stuff. 2 meg L2 cache, DDR4, we have 8 gigs on the board. Um, and then we have something called ChipLink, which is our board-to-board -board interconnect. So that goes between our ASIC, and then an FPGA-based Southbridge where you can put on accelerators or we use it for PCI Express and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then this is kind of my summary of the state of RISC-V software. So here we have uh, our ASIC, which is a quad-core RISC-V ASIC, talking to MicroSemi's FPGA board, um, which then goes through some shims to get to PCI Express and whatnot. And you can run basically the full software stack on it. So AMD GPU runs. We have a commercial GPU in there. We can run. Quake, or I think it says Tux Cart or Tux Racer or something like that. Um, you can plug USB stuff in, keyboard, mouse, uh, uh, webcam, all that sort of stuff. And you can go to the internet. So we have a web browser. You can go to YouTube or Twitter or all those sort of things. It is, it's an actual computer, which uh, I, <laughs> it was a lot of work. But it's, it's pretty cool to have seen the whole thing kind of come to life. Um, so that's kind of the end of what I have prepared for slides. This is my getting how, how to get involved slide, because the whole point of giving these talks is to get people involved in the RISC-V software development. You know, there's a lot of software. There's a lot of work still left to be done. Um, and hopefully, <laughs> this gets people reasonably excited about getting involved. So we have a blog at Sci-5 uh, where I had a sort of weekly newsletter about RISC-V developments, uh, mostly software stuff because I write it, but also some hardware stuff. Um, there's some RISC-V groups. Uh, there's also an IRC channel, which is a great place to go hang out. 
Um, and then if you're involved in open source software, like I assume most of you are here, uh, most of our ports are upstream now. And development happens where you'd expect it to happen, right? Upstream mailing lists. <laughs> We have a couple of ones for uh, the projects that uh, tend to get their own mailing lists, like Linux and QMU, and then binutils, G GCC, glibc, GDB, all at the FSF, just kind of like normal. Um, so I believe that is the extent of my slides. Yeah, because they're not going any farther. So uh, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So we do not have a chip that we will sell you that is synthesized using an open source flow. Uh, you, there are uh, FPGAs, like the Lattice FPGAs have been reverse engineered. And those, um, uh, there are RISC-V implementations that will synthesize for those. Um, and then I know I was supposed to, <laughs> I messed up my schedule and got caught giving two talks today. Um, one of them is in San Mateo, so I'm skipping that one. Uh, <laughs> but that talk was uh, at a group that, does, that is working on uh, open source RTL, open source EDA flow, and will give you chips. Um, and I'm really excited about that sort of thing. I think uh, you know, the, the open source hardware stuff is very exciting. Uh, RISC-V is only part of this. It's a necessary part. Uh, so having the ISA be a standard that people can actually implement, you have to have for uh, open implementations to exist. And then Sci-Fi has some open source RTL that lets you build stuff. And then I think the big missing piece of the flow is the open source EDA flow. Um, and hopefully now that there's you know, workloads to run and some targets you can target, things will start to come up. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone at SI5 contributing to LLVM? Yeah, Bruce Holt. Cool. Yeah, he's our LLVM guy. Um, so that's a big part of the stack in RISC-V that's gone a little slower. You know, you need one tool chain, but then once you have one tool chain, you kind of you know, the other one falls behind. But yeah, we got Bruce. Uh, the target for LLVM, which I believe is LLVM 8, which is the next release, is to get RISC-V out of experimental and having all the base ISAs and ABIs supported. So yeah, pretty exciting. Can you support the gen file that you're So we don't build microarchitecture simulators at Sci-5. So we have a functional ISA simulator, which is called Spike. We also have QMU, kind of the full system simulator standard thing. And for microarchitecture simulation, we rely on FPGAs. With the idea being that uh, if you go build a C microarchitecture simulator, they tend to be inaccurate unless you've already done the entire RTL design and then have gone and pulled the C simulator out of the RTL. Um, and then by the point you've done that, the FPGA implementations actually execute faster. Gem, you know, ex our FPGAs are hundreds of megahertz. Gem5 is tens of megahertz. So there is a RISC-V Gem5 port, um, but uh, I'm not involved in it. And a big, a big pillar of our research group at Berkeley was not to do Gem5. Uh, but there is one. OK. So the RISC-V ISA mandates a handful of performance counters. right? Uh, they're just the simplest ones, like a real-time counter available to user space, real-time clock available to user space, instructions are tired, and cycle counter. Right? So that's the stuff you get, base ISA. Uh, there's a bunch of requirements in the ISA about accuracy and uh, those sort of things. Um, so those are solid. Those are there. And you can do a lot of performance tuning with that. Additionally, what we do is we allow, in supervisor mode, a set of platform-specific performance counters. We do something called, in RISC-V called CSRs, which are control and status registers, which are the second tier of registers, right? The GP you know, integer floating point registers and the CSR stuff that control things off the side. That's where you put the page table based point and those sort of things. So there are uh, something like 16 of those. And those are machine-specific, and they can be multiplexed in a particular way. Um, and there's a scheme for standard extensions and vendor extensions. And that's where you do stuff like counting branch predictor misses and cache misses and that sort of stuff. So for Sci-Fi's platforms, we have a PDF that you can read. And then uh, you can go tell what the bits and the counters mean. There's no implementation in Linux yet. That's uh, something on the to-do list. There's been one kicked around, but it's not quite ready to go yet. Um, but that's a, that, that is a thing that will happen. It's super important.
Yeah. Oh, and then we have memory system stuff on sci-fi systems too, right? Cache, you can go probe registers in the cache to see your L2 misses and to mess around with ways and all, all, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, yeah? Uh, can you talk a little bit about Spectre and Meltdown? I know there was this big deal that oh, yeah, yeah. was not, you know, uh, uh, you know, wasn't those packs were not put forward RISC-V, but that's a very implementation specific Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a place where it's really easy to get uh, into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, good, great. So the the, the risk five is not vulnerable to Spectre is a really good headline, right? Um, but it's really uh, just nonsense because ISA doesn't really make any guarantees about speculative side channel attacks. So we do have a security group at the risk five foundation who is working on how to extend the ISA such that the ISA can basically discuss speculative side channel attacks. Um, but currently, there are no Risk Five implementations that are vulnerable to speculative side channel attacks. Uh, and this is one of the cool things about having the open source RTL is that we can actually go show you the signal in the pipeline that shoots down all speculative loads before they make it to the L1. Um, and then, you know, no, basically, no state is speculatively modified. There is the there was the floating point one on Intel. We do bypass from the floating point unit speculatively, but there's no way, because of how the pipeline's constructed, there's no way to get that data out of the floating point pipeline and into something you can then branch on without it being killed, right? Basically, the floating point pipeline's a little longer. Um, so that one's also not vulnerable. But the, the cache one, which is the big one, that's the one that's been exploited, all that sort of stuff. We can just go prove that it's not vulnerable because you can see the signal, and our implementation is not vulnerable. Yeah. Well, the goal is to have everything work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I tend to not, not try to do something unless we're going to take over the world. So um, yeah, that, that's the goal. Uh, right now, we have a lot of interest in bare metal embedded. Right? ARM's licensing terms are somewhat onerous if you're a hardware vendor. Um, and people jump ship because uh, it's cheaper or easier or that sort of stuff. Uh, so we see wins in the embedded space. Uh, some stuff in the, the deeply embedded space, power management controllers, that sort of stuff. Uh, Sci-5 recently had a couple of public design wins in the SSD space, right? So like the kind of R series stuff, higher performance embedded things. Um, and then uh, you know, we have Linux capable stuff. Uh, the cores, because the ISA is somewhat simpler, the cores tend to be smaller. This is part of the reason that we're not vulnerable to Spectre is because our five stage single issue core has similar uh, clock speed to a seven or eight stage ARM core, which makes it really easy to shoot down your loads before they get to the L1. It also makes everything lower power because your branch predictor is not as big. You know, your pipeline flushes aren't as expensive, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so there are you know, design, design reasons behind the ISA that allow implementations to be slightly higher quality on, uh, on RISC-V than on some other ISAs. And that manifests itself as either clock speed or power, or, you know, kind of the standard PPA, uh, put, push yourself around wherever you want to go in the, in the ASIC space. Um, I don't know if that's an answer to your question or not. It's kind of all over the place. <laughs> yeah? So, so how do you handle the extensions over time if you want to keep the, the ISA constant? Right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so there's a scheme. Um, OK, so there's the ISA, which is a PDF. Right, so the ISA itself is versioned. There was version 1, which was for the first tape out which is gone. <laughs> and there's version 2. Uh, and version 2 is what we intend to keep backwards compatible forever. So if something is in the ISA, then it remains compatible. So that means that if software can rely on a particular behavior, like say you know, the, an instruction doing a particular thing, right, uh, then that will continue to exist. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so uh, there, there, there's, there's a whole story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the ISA manual itself is versioned. You know, I think it's version 2.2 .2 or something now. It'll be 2.3, 2.4. And the way this happens is that extensions are proposed to the ISA. There's free encoding space in the ISA. And those extensions, once they're ratified as a proper specification by the RISC-V Foundation, are then locked in forever. Right? So if you're a piece of software that depends on the 2.2 RISC-V ISA, you're compatible with the 2.3 ISA, 
You're compatible with implementations in implement 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, all that sort of stuff. If you want the new extensions, then you need the new version of the ISA. But the old extensions and the new ISA never change. So, so I will have to do things in GCC later on to say? Yes, yes. GCC never stopped. And then there's all the microarchitecture stuff in GCC like you'd expect. But So the big thing we're working on right now in RISC-V land is a set of vector extensions with the base vector extensions and then some vector extension extensions. Um, and so that will require large amounts of work all over the software stack. Right? Uh, that's part of the reason we're really interested in LLVM because it's uh, got some slightly more advanced, advanced middle-end vectorization stuff going on. Um, but uh, in GCC land, we plan on supporting the, the breadth of ve auto vectorization that's available in GCC standard sets of intrinsics. Um, and there's lots of discussion going on right now about things like ABIs for a, a RISC-V vector extension, those sort of things, which are kind of very exciting. Um, um, yeah. Can you deprecate an extension? So uh, if you decide that uh, you know, someone, you know, an extension you know, had some problems and you're going to have the V2 of an extension, can you, is there a way to deprecate an extension? Because now programs that depend on a, uh, an extension that is now deprecated and like, yeah. So the ex it would be a different extension, not a. I mean. Right, but then the old extension might not. So be there is a kind of cohesive n scheme for describing what instructions are available on what RISC-V implementation. So that includes versioning versioning of extensions, uh, where you could make a, a a V3 of an extension that's no longer backwards compatible or something like that, and then software can query the platform to determine what environment am I running in, and you can hook that into things like iFunks or whatever. Um, we expose that to user space through the ELF uh, hardware cap uh, Oxvec stuff, um, which is not flexible enough for what we want right now, but that will grow as we grow the extension. And then we do things like encode into um, object files some relevant bits of ABIs and you know to make sure that you don't Mislink stuff there, so there's a whole, it's, it kind of flows through the whole software stack. And it's all been designed really such that, you know, like one tool chain can generate code for all of the various extensions, and you can detect them, and you can look at the object. So the whole, the whole thing was really designed to allow for flexibility and mix and matching of extensions. Um, the Debian port is, and Fedora ports are both single lib right now, but we have a multi lib scheme, and you could build a multi lib distribution that supports uh, uh, the dozen or so uh, ISA ABI combos that we think are interesting in Linux land. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit about DMA and how, how you do IO? DMA and IO, yeah. So, okay, so, uh, okay, so um, we have a weak memory model. But within that weak memory model, everything's coherent, right? Uh, aside from the device stuff, right? Um, so all, all the cores are coherent across the thing if you're building a standard platform Linux system, right? Um, so that's kind of all taken care of by the memory model, at least as far as Linux systems are concerned. Some deeply embedded stuff is weirder, but that's kind of just life. Um, so uh, for the IO stuff, we don't have a great story for it right now. So in RISC-V land, the mechanism by which you order Memory accesses is something called a fence. So uh, there's a fence instruction. The fence has bits on that instruction that order instruction or order accesses of a particular type against accesses of a different set of types. And the types there are read, write, input, and output. So the formal memory model specifies what read and write mean, and then that filters into all the AMOs and that we have LRSC and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but it does not specify what I and O mean. And so the next memory model group is to specify what I and O means. Uh, and then probably add mechanisms for or discussing, you know, non-coherent, you say like a non-coherent DMA device in the context of a RISC-V memory model, which is a very complicated thing to do. Uh, but it, it does need to get done. <laughs> uh, so we have, working, uh, we have graphics working right now because the I/O system on the chip is super simple. Everything is, you know, the. In, the, basically, the entire I/O subsystem, single point of coherence in order one one, uh, one outstanding request per core. So it's easy. <laughs> it's slow. <laughs> uh, that will that will get fixed. But that's one of those things where uh, we want to make sure that when we do a silicon implementation, that we are not particularly aggressive about things that have not been standardized. Because basically, you know, 
sequentially consistent I.O. system will be compatible with any I.O. memory model. Right? So we're basically safe, if that makes sense. Maybe I'm wrong about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's the current theory is to try to, and you know, this is small run, first board, that kind of stuff. But uh, the goal is to avoid taking advantage of things that are either weakly specified or informally specified or those sort of things, in the, in, particularly in the, the memory space, because you can really get yourself into a lot of trouble if you have systems that perform, I'm sure everyone's aware of systems that have all the weird reorderings, right? You read the, read the stuff and you can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you've got a lot of those floating around. So we're trying to avoid that. Um, but the spec is the important thing to work on. I've spent a lot of time reading a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. No, no, David Mossberg already, when he published it, was very specific about exactly how ordering works with I.O. also. Yeah. I, so, I, so, you know, we, so basically, the, it's all informally specified right now, right? So we have in our uh, I.O.H., right, we've got the suite of functions that you would expect, and they have the fences that. I think they should have, basically, because I wrote it. Right? There's no formal model describing what those fences do. So a legal risk of implementation could treat those fences as nothing. Right? There's a line in the draft platform specification that says, don't be an idiot. And uh, that's good enough for now, but we really do need, <laughs> we really need a formal spec for it. It's just, that's a really hard formal spec to write. So it's all there. And for the, uh, the weak memory model, before that was standardized, we had uh, you know, atomics.h. Right? That was implemented you know, with the one paragraph memory model. It's a weak memory model, release consistency, that sort of stuff. And that more or less matched what is in the kernel currently, uh, aside from a couple of issues. So we're probably most of the way there, but with memory model stuff, most of the way there is not good. <laughs> OK, any other questions? Thank you very much. Oh, I